In this video we'll go over 10 things that appeared in the game's files, but never made it into the live version of the game for one reason or another. And starting off this list at number 10, we have the Island of Kaladar. Kaladar was the name Blizzard originally gave the island that the world tree Teldrassil was going to be on top of. Once Teldrassil outgrew the island, they decided to build the city on top of it. But there were plans for the island to still be called Kaladar anyway. Eventually though, Blizzard kind of retconned the name of the island and just referred to it as Teldrassil at all times, even when not talking about the tree itself. But since the original name of the island was Kaladar, a lot of the map assets of the tree are referred to as belonging to the Zone of Kaladar, and a lot of the map assets are located in the folder called Kaladar on the WoW's client. And not only that, Kaladar was also the name of a battleground in Alpha WoW's testing, which never actually made it into the game. It seems Blizzard was 100% ready to go with the name Kaladar before they decided to just use Teldrassil for everything. In the Beta WoW and Alpha WoW clients, there existed two troll islands off the coast of Stranglethorn Vale, called the Island of Dr. Lapis and Gilligem's Island. Now, what's unique about both of these islands is that they were both basically done and were almost completely textured and full of trees, ruins, artifacts on the beach, and even a few houses and small abandoned towns and caves. Although, none of these textures were unique, which means they did eventually use everything on this island somewhere else in WoW. Now, considering both of these islands existed in lore and showed up a lot in the early WoW maps, it's a mystery as to why they were removed. But then again, a lot of stuff was removed for pretty mundane reasons, as we found out in the WoW Diary book, which came out last year. In the Warlords of Draenor beta, a new battleground was added to the game files called Heroes Through Time. Based on a Twitter comment of someone asking the PvP director about the island, Blizzard stated that it was an idea they were experimenting with, but that they eventually decided not to go with it in Warlords. The map is structured very similar to most battleground maps, as it has basically mirrored maps on both sides of the island, with the top half looking like it probably belonged to the Alliance, as it's all clean and proper and green, with the bottom half looking like it was probably the Horde zone, with red buildings and a little bit more rough in its architecture. Not much more is known about this island though. And at number 7, we have the Stormwind Warrior District. In Cataclysm, Blizzard experimented with another version of Old Town that included a retextured version of Stormwind Keep. Since Blizzard had to redesign Stormwind to account for flying in Cataclysm, it's possible they were planning on adding another district to Stormwind, called the Warrior District. Although this portion of Stormwind went unused and was never fully developed, so it's most likely just an idea they were throwing about. One that they put a little bit more time and effort into than they usually would, considering it also made it into the game files. And at number 6, we have another unused battleground, and that's the defense of the Ale House. This battleground map made it into the game files during Mist of Pandaria in Patch 5.2, and is a three-lane battleground which seems to take place in Town Long Steps. Now, seeing as the name of the battleground is a pretty obvious reference to the Defense of the Ancients, which was the original name of Dota, it seems like this map was supposed to be a MOBA mode for a battleground. While I have no clue how a MOBA would work with WoW's gameplay and battleground mechanics, being a fan of the MOBA genre myself, I would have loved to have seen Blizzard attempt to do it anyway, although it seems like they have no intentions of coming back to this map, and sadly, they probably won't ever release it. And at number 5, we have the Undead Nerubian Beast model. With the Wrath of the Lich King beta, a new model is added to the game files simply named Undead Nerubian Beast. This model has 5 different color variations, but no animations, which is pretty standard for models added to the game files, but never actually used in the game. They don't usually waste time animating models they don't intend to use. Now considering there are plenty of Undead Nerubians in Wrath of the Lich King, it's pretty obvious why they made this as it was probably a prototype for what the Nerubians were going to be in the game. And then they just ended up going with the models we actually got in the game instead. Although these could have just been another variation of them, but whatever the case, eventually they were scrapped and just never removed from the game files. And at number 4, we have some unused voice files. It's pretty rare for them to have voice actors record lines they never intend to use, and in this instance we have voice lines for Runus the Shamed. In NPC, players get to know very well while questing in Legion through the Azuna Zone. Now, in the questing zone, Runus is an NPC you come across as a Withered trying to attack you. After you beat him up a little bit, he decides to help you out. 
and tells you about an invasion planned by a horde of other withers who want to attack the blue dragons and steal their mana. And during the quest chain, Runus constantly talks about how he would never think of betraying you. And at the very end, he keeps true to his word and dies due to his mana withdrawals. Now, with the unused voice lines of Runus, we get a different ending to this quest chain. In the voice lines, Runus talks about taking the Tidestone, attacking the blue dragons, and stealing all their mana crystals. Currently, Runus is remembered fondly because of what actually went down in-game, where he helps players. So, I think it was a good move that they didn't go with the betrayal storyline, that these unused voice files hint were a planned option. The Tidestone. Such power. We will feast on the dragons instead. Sisters, brothers, the great mana crystal I promised lies in the pool above. Forget the Tidestone, brothers. Let the lizards and the lowborn have their crystal. Two can play at this game, except my touch actually hurts. Know your place or be put in it. If you don't stop, I'll drain every last drop of energy out of your corpse. Plebeian. Well, the Nightborn are not what they seem. So sorry, my friends. I just couldn't help myself. And at number three, we have the Items of Proficiency. This was a series of items which would give extra skills in certain weapons, up to a maximum of plus seven in that weapon skill, which is incredibly high. So basically, there are some items in the game that give random stats, and they generally fit to a kind of theme based on the name of that item. So an item of the bear, for example, would always have strength and stamina on it. An item named of the tiger would always have strength and agility and so on and so on. They would group up the stats based on arbitrary names. So they had random stats, but were always related to whatever they were named after, and sometimes would even be specific, like of shadow protection, which would give increased stamina and shadow resistance. And of proficiency items gave plus one through plus seven in all weapon skills, but these items were never actually added to the game. And there was a pair of gloves in Vanilla WoW that were incredibly sought after because they gave weapon skills. And I think these gloves gave plus seven weapon skills in three different weapons. So, if these of proficiency items would have been added, they probably would have been very sought after, which is why they were probably never added. But these items were completely programmed into the game, so you could even create macros that would link to them, despite the fact that none of them actually existed. And at number two, we have some more unused voice files. And these are for Lorthamar and Romoth. There is a whole set of voice lines indicating that Romoth was supposed to be the traitor during the Cataclysm for the End Time Dungeon. During Cataclysm, there was a Twilight Cultist traitor in both the Horde and Alliance, who was feeding information to Deathwing, and caused a lot of problems in the Horde. On the Alliance side, the traitor ended up being Archbishop Benedictus, which was kind of a big deal as he was a major lore figure. So for the Horde side to be Romoth just kind of made sense in relation. Romoth, for those of you who don't know, is one of the few lore important Blood Elf NPCs and is always accompanying Lorthamar and is located in game next to Lorthamar and Silvermoon. He has been involved in a lot of points in WoW, including being the NPC Horde players talk to during the purging of Dalaran scenario of Mista Pandaria, and he was also one of Kel'Thas' staunchest and most loyal supporters but turned away from Kel'Thas and sided with Lorthamar instead when he found out how far Kel'Thas had fallen, which was a big deal for his character. So he was a morally good character who wanted the best for his people. And there's a reason why they changed his planned traitor status, because it didn't really fit with his pre-established lore. Now, the voice files themselves basically just have Lorthamar accusing Romoth of being the Twilight traitor, shows him proof, and then there's voice lines of them fighting each other. Romoth, you stand accused of high treason to Silvermoon, and of being a member of the Twilight Council. Ah, the long knives come out. Is there proof to these accusations? This document. It's your handwriting. I'd recognize it anywhere. You leave me no choice, then. It's a pity, really. I had plans for our people. There is a war coming. And I've chosen to be on the winning side! You forced my hand a little early, perhaps. 
But I think you'll find I'm still playing. From a position of strength, feel my wrath! And at number one, we have the Wrath of the Lich King server first titles. Back in Wrath of the Lich King is when Blizzard added achievements to the game, including the idea of getting titles attached to your characters based on certain achievements. And there was a series of feats of strengths you can get in game for being the first person on your server to hit max level, get the highest level in the newest level professions, and for being the first person to complete the Northrend Vanguard achievement, which was an achievement for getting exalted reputations with all of the Northrend reputations available at the beginning of the expansion. Getting server furs in any of these three things would award you with the server first feat of strength, and a special title that only you would have. Like, for example, the first priest on the server to hit level 80 would get the Prophet title. The first Grand Master Enchanter would get the Grand Master Enchanter title. And the first Northrend Vanguard would get the Hero of Northrend title. And only that one person could get that one title per server. Now, there was a huge outcry in the forums over these titles. So during the beta, Blizzard removed the titles associated to these achievements and only left in the titles granted for getting the server first raid kills. People really didn't like the idea of only one person having an exclusive title, but were a little bit more okay with a group of people having an exclusive title for achieving a legitimately hard feat, like getting a server first raid kill. Eventually, Blizzard removed server first achievements altogether, but it seems like it was a neat idea to get an exclusive title like that. Alright, and that's the end of the video. I got a lot of information for this video from the website tcrf.net or the cutting room floor, which I'll have linked in the video description. And did you know, only 29.7% of people who watch my videos are subscribed? So don't forget to subscribe for weekly videos just like this one.